What's up, Jags fans? Here we are on a Tuesday night, a regularly scheduled program for once around here, except we started a little bit late, but that's okay. Uh, if you're new here, we do live shows on Tuesday nights, typically at 9 p.m. Tonight, we got a little bit of a late start, uh, but that's okay because we're here and we're talking about uh, the newest Doug Peterson. Uh, he, he did an interview at the NFL owners meeting with some Jags media and some other people and shed some light, I think, on... The future of this franchise, the direction that we're going. Unlike Trent Baalke, Doug Peterson kind of shoots from the hip and kind of tells you what he's thinking, which is nice for us Jags fans. We're going to take a look at some of the answers that he had to some questions, uh, questions about all type, different types of things. I think you're going to find it very informative. Uh, we're going to talk Jags here while we're watching it. So get into the chat. This is a fan show. So make sure that you are in the chat. As you can see to uh, my right, your right as well, uh, the chat's already popping off. So get in here, give me your thoughts on maybe Doug Peterson's answers, maybe the direction you think the Jags are going to go, um, all sorts of live things. This is just like long format, free flow talking show all about the Jags. So make sure you're subscribed to the YouTube channel, uh, hit the notification bell 
That way you get a notification whenever we go live because usually we're Tuesdays, but sometimes we're Mondays and sometimes we're Wednesdays and sometimes we're Thursdays and sometimes we're Fridays and then sometimes we're Saturdays and Sundays. So you just never know. So you want to make sure that you have the notification bell on so that you do get the notification. Finally, make sure you follow the social media, the Twitter, the Instagram are down below. Um, I'm much more active on Twitter or X, whatever it's called. I probably should change that logo at the bottom now that I think about it. So uh, follow me on all those things. It's always a good time. Always a good things talking Jags. So make sure to get into the chat and give me your thoughts. And we always shout out the first person in the chat because it's a race to get here first. And Robbie Santis was the first one in the chat. And he says, yo, Volk Fang was the first channel member in the chat. Volk Fang says, what's up, everyone? Eh, I'm, I'm doing all right, Volk Fang. Uh, then after Volk Fang, we're followed by three other channel members. C Breacher, who says, yo. 100 miles per hour says late, meaning that I'm late. No, I, I'll take that. I'll take that. Uh, channel member BT says Duval. All right, then we got some of the usual suspects in here. Robert Atzert, Callie Jag, Rajibs, Robbie Santis says, I always love a good live stream. Guy just says K. Uh, Rico, channel member, says, what's up, everybody? Nolly, Nolly Full Cab spams the Blake Bortles emojis, just like always. Duval TV says, yo, yo, everyone. I'm going to get to some of these more comments here. Uh, but let's just jump right into it. We'll get a couple of answers that Doug Peterson had. Um, first question he's going to get is uh, a great question, and that is the team better now than it was at the end of the year last year? Let's hear Doug Peterson's response. All right, let's go. Better team now than at the end of the season, and why? I mean, you, you would hope so, right? I mean, obviously, you, you, we haven't played a game yet, so um, we don't really know, but... I feel like we've added some pieces through free agency that are going to help us. They give us depth. Um, you know, we got some experienced guys in like Eric Armstead, Mitch Morse, who can really add some, uh, one, the competition you're looking for, but two, I think a veteran presence at those positions. You know, um, a guy like Mac Jones to come in and, and solidify and really give us three quarterbacks that, that – you're going to need, you know, um, as, as we've seen, uh, as history would say. You know, our number one thing, though, is to keep Trevor healthy. Our best chance of winning games is keeping Trevor healthy. You know, so I, I feel like we've – and then re-signing guys, you know, like the the, the, the DTs, right, um, Daniel Thomas and, and Caleb Johnson and, and restructuring Brandon and, you know, getting Ezra Cleveland back and just being able to kind of work through your roster that way and, and – um, you know, getting the guys that, that are going to help us win football games moving forward. All right, so great question, I think, to kick it off with is, is the team better now than it was at the end of the season? And I had to kind of think through this. And the first time I heard the answer, I was like, that's not a very confident answer. When I think about who we lost and who we added, I don't know if we're any better. Biggest loss is obviously being Calvin Ridley. Uh, if you want to talk about Rayshon Jenkins, losing him. Um, Calvin Ridley was a big loss, for sure. And he was replaced with Gabe Davis as of now. Again, we haven't drafted. So uh, I was like, uh, you know, Darnell Savage, is he better than Rayshon Jenkins? I don't really think so, to be honest with you. I know he's going to go on to say they don't play the same position, which is fine. I don't know about the answer. But he did, after hearing it a couple times, I, I did catch something there. I don't know if you caught it. He kind of pivoted to their philosophy was Trevor is the key to this team. So the addition of Mitch Morse helping Trevor stay healthy was their number one priority. So rather than bring Calvin Ridley back, they said we're going to go get a center. I think that's fine. I think this team goes as Trevor Lawrence goes. Um, interesting answer, though. But I do like how he's kind of honest. And so I'll take that. I think that's a good answer there. Um, is the team better? I wish I could say it was better. Now, hopefully they hit on some draft picks here at 17. Maybe they package some draft picks together and move up. Maybe Balky finally hits in the second and third and fourth round. But uh, interesting answer there nonetheless. Uh, Kevin says, Duval, what up, fellas? We got a new Jag fan on the way. Wife and I are having a boy. Kevin, bro, congratulations, bro. That is so awesome. I'm so excited for you and your wife. Um, and it's a boy. I mean, I know you would have been happy either way, but I know you're pumped that it's a boy. So that's so exciting, man. Uh, congratulations again. I uh, can't wait to see uh, how your life as a father goes. 
and adding a new Jags fan into the fold. Uh, C. Breacher says, I'm curious what United thinks about the new rule changes. So the two biggest rule changes being the kickoff and the hip drop tackle. Now, I don't know how the hip drop tackle is going to work, right? In the past, whenever they implement new rules like this, they call it really tight in the preseason, and everyone gets all freaked out because the refs are trying to learn how to call it. They're trying to teach the players how to tackle correctly. And then when the regular season comes around, they don't call it as much. Hopefully that's what happens with the hip drop. If it's a, if it's a penalty like roughing the passer that's just way too much, then it's going to make the game even worse. Uh, but I don't feel like this is going to do it. I mean, I think they said... When they went back and watched the games, the hip drop tackle was like once per game it would get called. So I don't think that will influence the game too much. But, I mean, we see roughing the passer calls like every drive it feels like now. So hopefully it doesn't get to like that. The kickoff changes, I don't know how this is going to work out. We did a, our whole last show last week. We kind of talked about kickers. I don't know why. Um, Riley Patterson, Joey Sly, we talked about how they're both on the roster. And we didn't even once talk about the new kickoff rule and which kicker gives you a better advantage on the kickoff rule. And like it can kind of go both ways. Like We feel like Riley Patterson's a more accurate kicker. So dropping the ball in that sweet spot, I think it's between the 20 and the goal line, I think Riley Patterson gives you a better advantage there. But when we're talking about kickers being able to tackle, Joey Sly is like massive. He's, I mean, he's got, he's got guns. It's a big boy. So it depends on if you're looking for a kicker that can tackle or a kicker that can place the ball. I think they both kind of gives you your advantages uh, there for sure. All right, so the next question Doug Pierce is going to get is about Mitch Morse and what he does for the team. What does that do? Well, yeah, you guys know I, you know, I was in Kansas City when we drafted him, so obviously liked him, and, and now that he became available, you know, um, and Luke's listen. This is not a, it's not a knock on Luke at all. It's just a matter of getting better at, at, at a position, getting better as a group. And I think Mitch brings a, a veteran presence. He's done it for several years now. And it's really somebody that Luke can invest some time learning from, right, and, and uh, understanding. You know, I think, I think Mitch's strengths can be Luke's weaknesses and, and vice versa, right? Luke's strengths, Mitch's weaknesses, and they can really work together and, and uh, ha have, have – what I would, you know, that competition that you want. And, and so having a guy like Mitch, a veteran backup, come in, uh, much like when we signed Brandon a couple years ago, uh, just, just helps us better as an offensive line. Now, this answer here, like, I feel like he does a good job of, like, not bashing Luke Fortner. I mean, we've been doing these shows every week for years, and the prevailing theme has been from you guys in the comments that we've got to do something about Luke Fortner. We've got to change the center position. We watched film week after week. That's what we do on this show. If you're new around here, we break down the film of all the games. Luke Fortner was the biggest weakness on the offensive line. So I think he did a, a nice thing here by not throwing Luke Fortner under the bus. I don't know what he was talking about when he said that Luke Fortner's strengths could be Mitch Morse's weaknesses. I have no clue what that could mean at all. The the Buffalo Bills GM was on the Pat McAfee show today, and he spent a considerable amount of time talking about how Mitch Morse is one of the biggest losses that they had. So I think Doug Peterson knew what he was doing with getting Mitch Morse. I think he's going to be a huge upgrade. We talked about it with the first answer. I think this team could be better than last year because, Doug, uh, because Trevor Lawrence could have more time because of Mitch Morse. Are you willing to – Lose Calvin Ridley, maybe bring in a rookie receiver, maybe just ride with Gabe Davis and hope that Trevor Lawrence makes them better. We've talked on this show a bunch about how Trevor Lawrence has made the careers of a lot of people that have been discounted nationally. The guys like Christian Kirk, Evan Ingram, Zay Jones, Jamal Agnew, all guys that Trevor Lawrence elevated them. Like they came to Jacksonville, played with Trevor, and then now they're like legitimate players. So maybe that's their hope with Gabe Davis. Um, but we're significantly better at Mitch Morse. And again, he does a good job here answering, does a good job talking about it. Um, Raw Jeebs says, Doug has a distinguished head of old man hair. I, I, what do y'all think? I think, you think I'm going to make it like that? I mean, I think he's got more hair than me. I mean, I wear hats a lot. And I think that's my downfall with the balding process. It's looking pretty good right now. Um, my dad's got some pretty decent hair. Um, not that there's anything wrong with I mean, I actually... Did talk about this last week. If I'm going to go bald, 
I'm going to shave it bald. I'm just going to grow out a massive beard. That's my strat. Chef Florida Boy says, hello. Guy says, I like the idea of keeping Trevor healthy, but an aged O-line sounds like injury issues by week three. Brenneman says, what's good, United? Not much. Happy to be here on a Tuesday night talking Jags, like always. 100 miles per hour says, Doug is the master of saying absolutely nothing with so many words. <laughs> he can't talk, that's for sure. Uh, Robert Atzard says, Luke Fortner sucks. Say it, Doug. Balky can't draft. Chef Boardway says, Luke's not good enough. Just say it. BT says, Doug and Trent never say anything really interesting. I'm sure they do with players, but with the media, they keep their cards really close to the vest. Hunter says, what even is Luke's strengths? Maybe he's got good camaraderie with Trevor Lawrence. That's all I can think of. Chef Florida Boy says, Luke was on his back more than a $20. Zoe says, wide receiver round one. I want to see Monteric Brown develop. He does talk about Monteric Brown. He gets a question about the corners, and, and he, I think he brings up Monteric Brown. Um, if he doesn't, maybe I heard it on the, on the national media today, uh, something like that. But, yeah, I mean, Monteric Brown, I mean, I had high hopes for him. I was surprised that he was drafted after Gregory Jr. That really surprised me when it happened, and it turned out that we were all right when we thought that. BT says, I find myself more worried that, that the Titans and Texans have made big upgrades this offseason. They really have. They really have. The Texans, I, I mean, Titans went out. I mean, I don't know if it just dawned on me today. I mean, I knew they had Calvin Ridley, but it just dawned on me today that now they have Calvin Ridley and DeAndre Hopkins. That's an insane wide receiver core right there. Might be one of the best in the league. The Texans got a lot better on defense, and we already know they're good on offense. And they added Joe Mixon on offense. So, I mean, they're even better there. So, you're right. Both those teams did get a lot better. The Colts are getting Anthony Richardson back in year two. This is going to be a tough division. There's no doubt about it. It's going to be a tough division, and the Jags have a lot to do. They have a lot to prove, and they got some tough competition coming up. King David says, I still say keep Press Taylor away from primary play calling. Uh, 100 miles per hour says the Titans have Will Levis, though. I actually am bigger on Will Levis than a lot of people. I think Will Levis showed some, showed some flashes last year. Volkfang says, I'm totally out on Cedric Van Pran, the center from Georgia, because his profile reads so similarly to Fortner. I'd prefer trying to pick up someone that is athletic and unpolished to sit behind Morse for a year. Kevin says, I would like to find a way to get Brock Bowers and have two great tight ends. That's an alluring prospect. I love Brock Bowers. I loved him when he was a freshman. I like we all did. Could they find a way to run two tight ends? They probably could. Didn't Doug Peterson run uh, Dallas Goddard and Zach Ertz at the same time? So, I mean, I think it, it could happen. C. Breacher says, I don't know how you guys feel, but me, it feels like we're going to be a corner at 17. The thing that just makes me like kind of worried about that is he kind of says later that Darnell Savage is going to be their nickel, which means that Ronald Darby is probably going to be their other corner. So if you have Campbell, Darby, and Savage already penciled in as your starters, do you take a first-round corner? I mean, maybe they do, but that's just the only thing that's – that's I don't know. The only thing that's making me just think maybe they won't. Again, I don't know what they're going to do. They tend to take best player available regardless of position. Chef Florida Boy says best in the league maybe like five years ago. Hunter Miles Power says, I'm still not convinced that Brandon Strange makes the team. He talks about Brandon Strange later. We'll get to that. Volkfang, there's so much wide receiver and corner talent in this draft, but I don't think the gap between second-round corners is as big as the gap between second-round wide receivers. Timmy Devil. What's up, Timmy? Says the NFL is going all offense. Tackling is now out. C. Breacher says having Savage, a guy that can't tackle at nickel, is not a recipe for success. My worry about Savage is his is his covering skills and coverage. Like we looked at his PFF when we signed him, and like I think opposing quarterbacks had like a seventy over seventy percent completion rating when th targeting him. That's not good. So maybe that's why he's in the nickel. He talks about how he can blitz and but I don't want him back at safety. He can play safety, and they talk about, I mean, they talk an hour about versatility here in a second, but let's get to, let's get to here. The next question he's going to get is about Gabe Davis. So, I mean, I like that question. Let's see how he answers. Gabe Davis fit into what you want to do on offense. 
And Gabe is that, that to me, he's like a, like a Swiss Army knife. You know, he he he, he can he can he obviously he can run routes. He, I mean, he, the guy's right around 81, 82 targets a year for the last four years. You know, if you average them out, so he's a he's a he's a big part of the offense. You know, in Buffalo, and I think he's going to be a, another key piece to, to what we're doing. And and you know, we can put him in positions to block. We can put him in positions to run. He, he's he's a good route runner. He's strong. He's big. He's local. You know, I mean, it, all things are positive with Gabe, um, and and really looking forward to getting him in there and seeing how he does fit with 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 Christian and Zay and you know uh, even Devin Duvernay now getting him in that mix and and obviously Parker Washington, Elijah Cook, some of the young guys we have. Uh, it should be a, a a really good, exciting off season to see just how we can make all these pieces work. This answer was the most interesting to me out of all of them. Because it was just me, or does it seem like Doug's kind of planning on having another wide receiver in that conversation, whether it's in the first round or the second round? Because did you notice how he answered it? He said he's a versatile guy, which is never something you say about someone who does one thing really well. And then when he spoke about his versatility, he said blocking was the first thing he said. Uh, running, like run plays, which how often are we going to do that? Good route runner, which is interesting thing to say. I guess that makes sense. And he said he's big, and he's looking forward to how he'll f- to seeing how he'll fit with Christian and Zay, who he brought up quickly, and then like subsequently remember Devin Duvernay and um, Parker Washington. So the way he answered this question kind of leads me to believe, again, I'm going all psychological here, right? We're going to study the body language of him, the answers, and it kind of seems like they plan on bringing a wide receiver in, either round one or round two, because this answer did not make me think that he's too confident in Gabe Davis being that guy. He brought up his, like, targets at, like, 70 or 80, which is, like, basically maybe him saying, like, he'll probably see around that again. And not anymore. So, interesting answer. I mean, am I am I am I over am I over reading that maybe? But it kind of just seems like that he's going to that they they have a plan to bring in another wide receiver, and pro- obviously it has to be through the draft at this point, unless they wait till the July first cut dates and bring in someone a veteran or something like that. Um, it just it just seems like um, just seems like he's got some up his sleeve at the wide receiver position. Just the way that he answered. Uh, a guy like Doug Peterson who is offensive-minded and even, like, considered an offensive guru, you feel like he would have given a stronger answer about the wide receiver position than what we just heard. And again, maybe I'm reading too far into it. But it seems like they have a plan to bring someone else in. That's what it sounds like to me. Timmy Devil says, Savage is no good in coverage. Volkfang says, I feel like Savage is there in case they aren't able to take a good nickel in the draft. RM Skip, channel member, Says, so are you saying we replace Trey Herndon with a Herndon 2.0 in Savage, someone who can't cover? I mean, Darnell Savage really didn't play that many snaps in the nickel. I mean, maybe he did two years ago, but last year he didn't. Um, he played most of his snaps in, in, like, free safety. And he wasn't great in coverage at free safety. So maybe they evaluated him as being a better coverage guy at the line of scrimmage, and they he, he references him blitzing. We'll get to that in a second, but I don't know. They definitely see that they're going to be drafting a wide receiver in a corner at some point early. Timmy Devil says, I want to see Monteric Brown, too. He did good when he was called on in that Saints game. Are we draft and develop or not? I think we should be, but, like, he was drafted in, like, the sixth or seventh round. That's not typically a draft and develop round. It, it, it could be, and maybe it should be, but it's not typically. So, I get what you're saying, but I'd be okay if we drafted another guy. Uh, he goes on to say, my friend is a Green Bay Packers fan, and he said fans only wanted him in only certain defensive sets. And it's not like the Packers didn't have a bunch of money. Like, they could have brought Savage back if they wanted to, and they chose not to. And I know they had a safety that they liked better, can't remember who it was, that they wanted to just get more playing time. But, yeah, I mean, they could have paid him and gotten him at the nickel, probably, if, if they thought he was that good, and they they know him better than anybody. Hunter Mosspar says, I mean, you don't call the 49ers about Ayuk if you're not trying to add big time at the position. 
Good point. Very good point. Rubicon Racer says, let's go get a real wide receiver one. When's the last time we had had that? Blackman? Um, yeah. Blackman um, was a number one for sure. Trying to think after that. I mean, we just had a bunch of ragtag dudes. I mean, Allen Robinson was a number one, right? Um, Kirk. I think Kirk's a one, dude. I mean, I really do. I mean, he's not like big, over the top type number one you think of but he's a as far as like yards and, and efficiency and production and even like nuanced things like his relationship with trevor lawrence and how trevor lawrence looks for him and he's always open and uh, i think you could supplement christian kirk as wide receiver 1a and then bring another guy in as 1b and that would be okay i'd uh, rather draft the receiver than go get um a ba from brandon Ayuk from the 49ers that looks to be another Ridley case coming the following year. Yeah, I mean, he's we're going to have to pay him $15 million if we pick up his option this year or pay him like Ridley money. You're right. So I don't know why that call was made, to be honest. It really makes no sense to me. All right, next question is about Evan Ingram. And uh, specifically, is he going to try to get Evan Ingram to make more plays down the field rather than be like a check down guy? So good question. Talk about um, making more plays down the field. That's what he wants to make his next step. After. Evan, Evan Ingram, yeah. So is that the next progression for him to be more of a downfield guy? And, or that a lot of that depends on how you want to use him. Right? Yeah, it depends on how you want to use him. But I, I, he's definitely capable of doing that. He's shown that. We've got as a staff, we've got to put him in positions to, to do that. Number one. Um, and yeah, I mean that. You know, for a guy like Evan, I think that's. You know, with his skill set, I think it's uh, would only help us, right? Um, with his, his ability to get down the field, his speed, you know, strong to the catch point, all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, and, and again, it, I, I, I put it more back on us as, as, as you know, play callers, decision makers to, to make sure that we are, you know, putting him in that, that position. Was the Brenton screen? I mean, weird question. Some of these questions were kind of weird. I don't, and basically he answers the way that I think we all would answer. Because the question again was, like, do you want to see Evan Ingram develop more as a down the field tight end? When in the reality of it was, is this offense wasn't set up because of the protection on the offensive line for anybody to be down the field threats. Much less your tight end, who's your number one safety valve for Trevor. I mean, the reason why he was the check down guy was because that's all the time Trevor had time for to throw to. So they were thinking probably. If we're going to use Evan Ingram at all, he's got to be a short, curl, flat type receiver. And that's what he was. And so he, they took the onus on themselves. It's, all, it's on us as play callers, but it's not on them as play callers. It's on them as a team to give an offensive line to Trevor who can have time to throw. So he even says, like, he can do it. He's big. He's fast. He's got strong hands at the point of catch. He can do it. It's just he never had time to to even get down the field. So, dumb question, but that's that's media for you. I'm sure if I was there, I'd probably ask a dumb question, too. I, I don't know. I probably would. I probably would. Hunter Miles Power says, people still definitely sleep on Christian Kirk. He would have had more yards than Calvin last year if he had finished the season. Good point. Timmy Devil says, Pacheco, A.B., James Robinson, it doesn't matter where you picked United. He balled against Michael Thomas, Granted, it was an old Michael Thomas, but he held his own. He could have been a lot worse. Mac Gobbin says, trade up with the Saints for Brock Bowers, please. Bowers is the best damn ball catcher in this draft. Volkfang says, Trevor has one second to throw. <laughs> Guy says, best defense is a great offense. Someone said that. So draft the number one wide receiver. I love it. Steven Giles says, I feel like Christian Kirk is like a McCardell type. I think we're still looking for our next Jimmy Smith, and he's not on our roster yet. Timmy Devil says, Brock Bowers. Hmm, I like it. Get him. And Lad McConkley. McCon McConkney? McConkley? McConklin? McConk something? Chef Border Boy says, that's cool, but how good is Buster Brown at press man? I was trying to think about that, actually, because they were talking about Ryan Nielsen and his defense and how they're going to use him and they is a lot of press man and I was thinking back to when we broke down his film years ago and him at Arkansas and I felt like he was pretty aggressive at the point of attack as a press corner um, I can't exactly remember but I feel like he was 
I thought he was. All right, here's our next question. Well, before we get to the next Doug Peterson question, let's get to Sea Breachers. Would you be upset if we took D-line in round one? I think at this point, yes. And here's why. Because we went out and got Arik Armstead. Uh, Arik Armstead is going to be your three technique, um, nose type situation. So you have the Devon Hamilton. You have Roy Robertson Harris. So I feel like you have your interior D-line now. Now, can you get depth there? Of course. But I think they have their starters penciled in. Um, so they need depth, but I don't think they're going to go round one. And I know I just said like moments ago that they, they like to take best available player. So maybe they do regardless. Um, but I just don't see where he gets fills in on the starting roster because you have Devon Hamilton and Roy Robertson Harris on the books for a significant amount of money. So we need help other places like wide receiver and corner. My cat is biting me and attacking me. Okay. Um, Jaggernaut says, what's up, Jags United? Hope everyone is doing great. Uh, Volkfang says, there's so many guys that aren't going to go until round two or three that I want on this team. Well, good. I think coming up in the next week or so, we're going to be doing our chat mock draft. So we're going to do a mock draft. And I'm letting y'all pick. So that's probably going to be maybe next week, maybe the week after. Depends on how I'm feeling. Uh, all right. Next question is about Britton Strange and if he's going to help with Evan Ingram being able to play down the field. Strange addition supposed to kind of help that. Working? Yeah, you know, it, it is and it will. Um, you know, and, and you know, Brenton's another young tight end that we got to find ways to get on the field and, and create create some matchups. We like what he did last year for us, and we can now we can build upon that and and. Uh, um, I think that tight end room is a strong room, even with Luke, you know, with Luke in there. And um, it just, again, there's there's depth and there's there's stability, which uh, which you got to have. We like what we got out of Brenton Strange last year. That's where he kind of lost me there, right? I think he genuinely likes the tight end room. I think the part where he's, he talked about Luke Farrell – um, I think they legitimately like the stability, like he said, of the tight end room. But to say that you liked what you got out of Brenton Strange. And again, he does a good job taking it on the chin. He said we it's another thing we as play callers got to do to get him more involved. But we all watched every game last year. It didn't matter what play you called. This team could not run the ball. And this team couldn't give Trevor time to throw. So... Uh, to all you people that I, I say this almost every show about press Taylor. I'm not as hard on press Taylor as a lot of people are because it's hard to call plays when you have no offensive line. In fact, it's probably nearly impossible to call plays when there's no offensive line. I would even go out on a limb and say 75% of offensive coordinators probably would be good play callers with a good offensive line. Yet we see half of them get fired every year. Why? Because it's, you can't call plays with no blocking. So, no, you're not going to call more plays to get Brenton Strange involved because there's nothing that he does that we can't get out of Evan Ingram with one second to throw. Now, if we had time to throw and you wanted a levels concept out of a two tight end set and have Ingram run a deep route and Brenton Strange run a short route, then yes. But in order for a levels concept to work with a deep route involved, you have to have three to four seconds to throw. And Trevor didn't have that. So, again, it's all boiling down to the offensive line. Which we added Mitch Morse. But that's it. We hope we get Cam Robinson in more games. I think he played half of them last year. So we hope we get Cam Robinson in more games. But I think they still have to draft an offensive lineman. Still. I, I, I mean... Uh, Timmy Devil says, give me another pass rusher. Cam Boysvert says, I still think if uh, Jackson Powers Johnson is there round two, we have to take him. Volkfang says, Bulky and the Jaguars have forsaken wide receivers in the draft since Blackman. Brenneman says, Doug talking out of his ass there. Strange was non-existent. Chef Florida Boy agrees and says, that's a good cap, Doug. Timmy Devil says, uh, Luke Farrell can't catch. Matthew Cross says Strange had a couple big plays as a rookie. Okay. 
So Matthew Cross is on the Britain Strange board. I'm still holding out hope. Again, I don't think we could even get a fair evaluation of Britain Strange because of the way this offense performed last year. This offense was pathetic last year. So how do I expect a rookie backup tight end to perform when the offense was pathetic with the starter non-rookies is my point. Volkfang says, doubt will be in range for Jackson Powers Johnson. Zach Frazier, maybe, but I like a mid-draft pickup of Tanner Bortolini. Okay. I feel like every time Farrell was called on, he performed. I like Luke Farrell, too. Chase says, Doug and Press are one in the same. Facts about the O-line. King David says, so with the same or slightly different O-line, Doug was able to make it work, but a year later, Press wasn't. That's my point. That's, I mean, it's hard to argue that, but I feel like we all would say that, and maybe we wouldn't all say this, but I, I feel like we've kind of, the sentiment was that Luke Farrell had a, I'm sorry, that Luke Fortner had a huge step back last year. Like, I feel like he was better as a rookie. Brandon Sheriff, I feel like hasn't, hasn't gotten better. Um, I think Juwan Taylor was a lot bigger piece of this offensive line than people are willing to give him credit for. Um, but you're right though. The offensive line were the same people, and they didn't perform. Timmy Devil says, Strange was a no-show. I thought they would showcase him more. You got him in the second round, for God's sake. Wasting picks. Farrell was fantastic, says Volkfang, but maybe they spend a mid-round pick on a tight end that is, quote, versatile and just does a little bit of everything, like Sanat or Theo Johnson. Guys, the secret weapon is Luke Farrell because they won't bother covering him. <laughs> McGobbin says, I don't think they take O-line till late in the draft or at all. They seem weirdly committed to this group. Stephen Giles says, what are your thoughts on Ezra Cleveland? Likely the answer at left guard? You liked him in the film review. You did right after we got him. I still do like Ezra Cleveland. I think playing next to Luke Fortner hurt everybody on the interior, including Brandon Sheriff. Um... So I'm okay with Ezra Cleveland. I really am. I think he'll be okay there. I think he'll be fine. And he's a swing guy. He can play tackle too. So I'm okay with that. I, I am. I'm okay with Ezra Cleveland. All right. Next question is about Darnell Savage. New corner nickel slash safety. This is what Doug had to say. This is you brought in was Darnell Savage. What would you like about him? You know, he he's a... His nickel, his nickel coverage ability inside, uh, his his ability to blitz. He, he's, a, he's, a, he's a good tackler. He's a willing tackler. He's, he's a he's a pretty good cover guy. You know, I mean, just all things that, that we were looking for at that position. And he's got the, the versatility to play multiple spots too on defense. So he does give you that, that safety flex if you want to do it. Uh, he can play that nickel spot if if you want to move him in there. Um, we have a young kid, Antonio Johnson. It's, it's going to be a nice little, uh, you know, work in progress there with, with these two guys, and and um, just excited again to, to get him in and, and get him get him working when he when he can. The safety mark. First of all, Doug Peterson would be a terrible podcaster because he doesn't know how to talk into a microphone. I get he's trying to make eye contact with the reporter, but buddy, you're not answering for the reporters. You're answering for us. For God's sakes, turn and talk into the microphone so we can hear what you're saying, Doug. Secondly, another answer, much like Gabe Davis, where he kind of was kind of vague about excited to get him in to see how he fits. That's typically an answer you give about a guy you don't plan on starting. Like, you don't bring a guy in to start if you don't know how he's going to fit. Um, so, this leads me to believe, just like wide receiver, corner is also high on their board as an early draft pick and they plan on bringing a guy in that's going to replace all these guys and Darnell Savage might just be like a rotational guy they didn't pay a lot of money for him wasn't a guy that was a huge splash nationally um, Green Bay didn't even want him back so again I think we're kind of hyping up Darnell Savage and maybe we're not hyping him up maybe we're giving him the exact amount of, round of hype, amount of hype and that he's going to be a rotational safety, maybe a three-safety look at times, coming at nickel, um, give you depth when, when injuries inevitably do happen. Another weird answer, though. Hunter Mosbauer says, I genuinely think Strange would have been there in round four when we took Ventrell Miller. 
it's not fair. We can't quite evaluate Ventrell Miller yet because he hasn't played. So I'm going to reserve judgment on that. I know we don't expect him to be very good. But we can't judge quite yet. Now, I know Travis Etienne was a first-round pick, and Ventrell Miller was, uh, a, well, was he a, a fourth-round pick. But they both missed their entire first year with an injury. And Travis Etienne came back and played really well. So maybe Ventrell Miller will similarly surprise us. That's the most optimistic way you're ever going to view Ventrell Miller ever. And you only get that here on this channel. <laughs> Brenneman says, I think we go O-line in the first like last year. Wasn't it a surprise we went O-line last year? I don't think so. I think a lot of people had us taking um, an O-lineman. I, I know I know. I talked about um, who was the kid from Oklahoma. Um, I can't remember his name. That ended up being pretty good this year. Um, you know, I think we had the glaring need after Juwan Taylor got signed away from us. So, if anything, that might lead us to go get a wide receiver because we lost a big time player to as a cap, not a cap casualty, but just a free agency. And we got a comp pick for him. So if on that same logic, maybe we'll go wide receiver this year. Matthew Cross says we had Ingram setting NFL records. What did we want from strange? I see your point. I see the point you're trying to make. I think the thing that makes everybody upset is that we used a really high draft capital on a guy that had nearly zero production. I get that we couldn't have seen Evan Ingram's career year happening. But you had to know the way you were going to use him that you were going to get like good production out of Evan Ingram. So why use a second-round pick on a player that isn't going to give you anything? At all. What if they would have drafted an O-lineman with that pick? What if they had drafted a wide receiver with that pick? What if they had drafted a corner with that pick? What if they had drafted a safety with that pick? What if they had drafted a D-lineman with that pick? You could almost point at any other position of need and would have set us up for success a lot more than a second string tight end. I think that's what makes everyone a little hesitant and down on Britain Strange. Again, that's why I think they're taking best player available. Um, it is what it is, boys. It is what it is. Maybe, maybe, maybe he'll surprise us. Maybe he'll surprise us. Timmy Devil says, move forward to long snapper and put Ross Matisic in the trenches. Boom, I fixed the team. Okay, we're not moving the Pro Bowl long snapper, Ross Matisic. He is our long snapper. He belongs in the pride of the Jaguars. And I might get a jersey if he gets the Pro Bowl again. Volkbang says, I don't know that you can say it was the same O-line. There was so much missed time and lingering injuries last year, but we still need to get better. Volkbang says, they'll take O-line if they have the picks because the depth was so bad last year. McGobbin says, no, it wasn't Brennan because we lost our right tackle and Robinson got suspended. It was pretty much guaranteed we were going to go tackle. Matthew Cross says, yeah, second round, but his rookie year isn't his whole career. Have some patience before we throw players away. This isn't fantasy. Okay, Matthew. All right, listen. I'm, I'm with you. I'm still holding out hope. I'm just telling you the reason why people are mad at Brenton Strange. I'm not saying it's right. I get it because I get all the points I just said. Like that's that's valid reason to be upset. Because even now going into this year. Why can't Evan Ingram have another career year with another year with Trevor and Trevor getting better and the O-line getting better? Why can't Evan have another career year? And by that logic of what do we expect from our backup tight end if Evan Ingram has a career year and if we expect Evan Ingram to have a career year again, we still don't need a tight end or a backup tight end. We could have used that pick high draft capital, very high. You can get a good player in the second round on a player that could be starting for us this year. And now you don't have to go get Eric Armstead. And maybe now you don't have to go get Ronald Darby. Or maybe now you don't have to go get Ezra Cleveland midseason last year. Or maybe now you don't have to draft the receiver in the first round. So it's just what could have been, which I know is not fair. But I, I get the logic. But I'm, I'm, I'm with you, Matthew. I'm going to hold out hope. 
that the pick will still redeem itself. Chef Border Boy says, everything he said, Savage does well. Uh, the, the Dim says otherwise. The film says otherwise. Doug is a podcaster. <laughs> Brennan says, Doug talks like he's always got to think of what to say next. No confidence. <laughs> Timmy Devil says, I like Strange. I actually like the pick. Even though the pick cam came out of left field, I think he has huge upside. If Timmy Devil is big on a draft pick from Balky, I think that's all I need to be convinced, to be honest. Brennan says, uh, sounds like he's not confident in any of our free agents. Is Balky even, is Balky taking Doug hostage? Hostage. Hostage. Uh, D. Steiny says, Ventral Miller was the heart of the defense his last season at Florida. That's true. He was very good at Florida. Uh, McGobbin says, Doug has way too much vocal fry with all the you know to be a good podcaster. McGobbin, I thought the exact same thing. <laughs> I thought the exact same thing. But I will say, my vocal filler, because, you know, they teach you in public speaking rather than using vocal fillers like um or uh or you know or things like that is to pause, right? And it's something that you have to actually work at when you're public speaking. It's uncomfortable to pause, but it's like the right thing to do when you're speaking. But you have to practice that. You have to rep it. You have to think about it. And these guys aren't public speakers. My filler, my vocalized filler is also you know. Like, like, you know, like whenever I'm like trying to think of my next thought, I'll say, you know, you know. So I noticed that right away about Doug. So that's funny that you, that you picked that up because I picked up the exact same thing. All right. Next question is about, um, has the safety position been, or no, the, the question was actually not has the safety position been devalued. It was the statement, the safety position has been devalued. So does the versatility of Darnell Savage add something? which is a very interesting phrasing of the question. Let's see how Doug responds. What's the, the impact value of having a versatile piece like Darnell, like, like, like a safety do a lot of things in your defense? I, I, I think anymore um, you're starting to see more guys with position flexibility, um, you know, just like you, you would offensive linemen, right? You know, guards that can play center, tackles can play both sides, you know, um, receivers you can move receivers around I just think it's a it just helps your overall overall team and, and, and if you do have an injury at a, at a position you can plug and play a guy and, and so having a guy like Darnell who has that that ability to play some safety even even Antonio who we drafted Antonio can play safety he can play nickel so you know you got you got the best of both worlds out of those two guys How much do you stupid question stupid answer not stupid answer stupid question does this versatility of Savage help you? What a stupid ass question. What a st no, it hurts you. It, it hurts you that the guy can play multiple positions. It hurts you. Like, we don't look for that. You know what? We want a guy that's pigeonholed into one position, and that's all they can do. And the other team knows it, and we know it. Oh, that's the guy that's real valuable to us, the guy that can only do one thing. What a stupid ass question. And I can't believe that person is even allowed to ask questions. I don't know who it was. Fire them. Fire them. Moving on to the next question. Uh, sorry. Equally stupid question. Is it in... Okay. Okay. Never mind. I take that back. I take that back. It, it is stupid, but I get what's happening here. Because I think this is actually Hayes Carline, who I like. And he asks, is it important to be versatile in the new defensive scheme? Which on the surface, stupid question. And to an extent, it is a stupid question. Because you're letting Doug, again, give you a vague, no answer, answer. I get what Hayes is trying to do. He's trying to get a little bit of insight on what Ryan Nielsen's going to run on defense. So I get the heart of what he's trying to do. But he should have phrased it differently. Because I can't remember exactly what Doug says. But I'm sure it's going to be some vague coach speak about how versatility is good on defense. But that's what the question is. Is that important in the new defensive scheme? For you guys to be able to do that? Yeah, it is. It is. Um, you know, Ryan's scheme is, is a little more four down, um, you know, and look, you're playing 75 plus percent anyway in nickel defense, right? So you're always going to be in four down fronts and 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 you're gonna always going to play with a nickel, whether it's a, a normal nickel body or a big nickel as, as a third safety, you know, teams want to call it sometimes. Um, but yeah, it's all part of what Ryan wants to do and what he wants to get uh, accomplished. How much do you so, yeah, 
Ryan Nielsen wants to be versatile. Great question there, guys. Way to we have we have 33 minutes of video of Doug Peterson talking, and I have it charted here because I have what the question was because I know we can't hear. We have now spent uh uh over two minutes of the 30 minutes on the versatility of players and the importance of it in the NFL. Like, we, we get mad, and I'm going to just rant for a second here. We get mad at coaches and GMs for not giving us answers and being vague and using coach speak. But when you ask dumbass questions like this for two straight minutes, what do you ask the freaking question? How much are you going to use Brenton strange next year? Ask the question. Uh, Hey, is Darno Savage going to be a starter or Hey, is Ryan with Ryan Nielsen having a history of playing press man? Does that mean that Darno Savage is going to play both positions or do you see him playing more at the nickel? But no, hey, is versatility important in Ryan Nielsen's defense? Hey, yes, versatility is important in everyone's defense. Hey, is it important? Is versatility good for this player? Yes, versatility is good with every player. Like, I, okay, I got to read some comments here. I'm, I'm making myself angry. and I, I, I shouldn't be. Okay, okay. I'm backed up on comments. I'm backed up. If I missed it, just type it again. I'm sorry. Um, Brenneman says Twitch after. What time is it? 10.19? Eh. I might, I'm, I'll probably jump on Twitch for 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 maybe maybe a couple hours. Yeah, yeah. Twitch is in the in the video description. Uh, Rubicon Richard says, "I feel that rage listening to reporters ask dumbass questions." <laughs> uh, Hunter Mossbro says, "Hey Doug, is it important that players can play the game?" Uh, McGovern says, "I actually really like the idea of Savage and Antonio switching back and forth between safety and nickel. Could create some really confusing defensive sets." If by confusing, you mean uh, the offense looks at whoever's playing free safety, and regardless of who it is, they probably can't cover the deep ball. Is that what you mean by confusing? Because if I'm an offense, and I'm under, and I'm in shotgun, and I'm in two-by-two two set with four wide receivers and a tight end or a running back in the backfield, and I see Darnell Savage at free safety, I'm throwing a vertical. If I'm in two-by-two two set, 10 personnel, maybe a running back, no tight end. Maybe I'm an empty with a tight end out there. And I see Antonio Johnson back there at free safety. I'm probably running a vertical. I don't think we have a safety opposite of Andre Sisco, who I'm even suspect can stay healthy, that can cover a vertical. I mean, you could try to reroute them with a linebacker or a nickel and maybe try to funnel them into the middle and play like a three high or, a, or one high look in the middle. But didn't work last year. And I feel like you had better corners last year. In fact, unless we draft a guy who's better than Darius Williams, we had better corners last year. I'll give you Rayshon Jenkins. He wasn't terrible. He was just expensive this year. Antonio Johnson's unproven. This team is clearly sacrificing defense for offense. Which, maybe, it's that, maybe that's the strat. Maybe that's the right strat. And maybe I'm just yelling for no reason. Maybe, who cares about defense? Blow it up on offense. And in that case, I'm wrong. I mean, you can't tackle anymore. So, I mean, maybe maybe, maybe that's it. Chef Waterboy says, hey, Doug. <laughs> is it important to use the Gatorade bottles? <laughs> uh, Zenith RX says, week one when Trevor went to scramble and threw the touchdown to Ridley when Strange was open the entire play, it seemed like how the season was going to go for Brenton Strange. Jaggernaut says, sorry if this was already answered. Don't, don't apologize. I know I'm a little angry right now, but it's not at you. It's not at Doug. It's the stupid questions the reporters are asking. If this was our, But with drop tackles gone, are we going to see more explosive plays via broken missed tackles? Thanks. I don't think this season. I think this season, if you're gonna, the biggest change you're going to see is just more 15-yard penalties on the drop tackles. Um, more extended drives, similarly to how we saw drives be extended on roughing the passers that shouldn't have been called. Definitely year one. Now, year two, year three, year four, yes, maybe. And maybe it's what the, the NFL wants. I mean, I read an article yesterday about how the NFL is concerned about the point dip in the total scoring last year. 
Now, if you look at the amount of quarterbacks that were injured, that maybe had something to do with it. And maybe that was the hip drop tackles. Maybe that was the roughing the passers. And maybe that's what they're doing. But, yeah, eventually. And that's what the NFL wants. And maybe that's why the Jags are just abandoning defense, is what it seems like. I mean, they went and got a Rick Armstead, so, I mean, I don't know. Okay. Next question. Finally, we got some good questions. And and not really. There's a, one good one and one bad one. But will losing the way you did last year serve as fuel for you guys coming back this year? Hmm, now we got a good one. Not winning the division, especially, frankly, losing it the way you did, you think will serve as fuel for the guys that are coming back? Yeah, you're, you know, obviously as a coach, you're hopeful that that's the, that's the motivation, right? I mean, the way we finished the last month and a half, um, it's not our standard, and, and it's not, not what we talk about. It's, um, it's, it goes against everything we talk about, really. Um, you know, and we... Can this guy in the background scribbling on a notepad just slide over like four inches like do we have to see this dude scribbling out of control on okay still had opportunities all the way to the, the you know the 18th week of the regular season so you know we're, we're there at the end uh we just got to figure out a way to, to kind of push through that envelope and 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 be there and, and credit houston i mean they they battled their tails off all year they were much like us a year ago in 22 we had to battle our tails off to, to get where we got to so uh, credit to D'Amico and, and his staff and those players in Houston, you know, for winning the division the way they did. Flip back to the number you mentioned. Okay, right, so I mean, I, I mean, at least they're. A, I mean, it only took them, you know, a, a third of the way in to ask about the collapse of last season. And Doug is is candid about this. He he says that, you know, hopefully it motivates them. You hope that it motivates them. And he's going to go on to talk about this a little bit more. He gets asked about this a little bit uh, later and says, it, you know, it stings a lot the way they collapsed. It's nice seeing – I mean, I, w I will give Doug credit for this is he does kind of seem to take more responsibility than other people in the Jaguars' front office, which I like because you guys know me. I'm a big ownership guy. Got to take ownership. Got to take ownership. If you're leading people, dude, you got to take ownership. You're you're in charge. The bucks. If you're in charge, the buck stops with you. So if a subordinate doesn't get the job done, and you blame them, you're a bad leader, and you're an even worse leader because you won't address the fact that you got to change it. So at least I like the fact that. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I saw guys comment. It's <laughs> the guy in the back. All right, guys. I can't. I let's just keep. Let's just keep going. He's he's gonna get asked about stupid question. It's a long question and it makes no sense. But basically, he talks about like when you the the first year with the Jags, you were on the hunt and you did really well. And then the second year you were with the Jags, you were the hunted. And then he talks about how in Philly, the first year in Philly, you were the you were on the hunt. And then the second year year you were the hunted. And, like, what's the difference, right? Stupid-ass question. You were the hunter in 2022. Last year, you were the hunter. Are you, in some ways, I mean, you, you had to get to Philly, your team's in Philly the same way. Started out as hunters and then became the hunter. Uh, not missing you, anything. How do you kind of, kind of balance that? Do you feel like teams do better as the hunter? Or? I I guess. I mean, you know, now we're, we're going back to the, the, the hunter again, right? I mean, um, but, you know, this is the culture that I want to establish in, in Jacksonville, and, and this is the reason why you go get guys like Mitch Morse and Eric Armsteads and the Darnell Savages and guys that have been to the postseason. These guys have been captains on their teams, and, you know, they've been to Super Bowls. They've, they've been to AFC Championship games. Um, you know, so these guys know how to win, and, and that's – that's kind of the influx of talent that we want to bring onto this our young roster. Guys that have been there, done that, and and um, you know, again, it's just I've got to continue to, to message the team in the right way, and and you know, there's got to be a sort of a confidence about you that you know when you when you take the field on game day that hey, you know, yeah, you, 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 there's gonna be game, you're gonna get beat. I understand that, but you got to have that confidence and that swagger that that uh, you know you're gonna get the job done, you know, uh, on game day, and and I think bringing in some of these free agents we did this this spring um 
are going to help that. How long did it take you? Oh, sweet. Thanks for wasting all of our time with that stupid ass question. Uh, Timmy Devil says over under on drop tackle flags. Preseason, they're going to be a lot. I think in the regular season, you're going to see about one a game. Chase says no more pass rushing. Have to count seven alligators instead. <laughs> or just put flags on them like people have been saying. BT says, I think I could answer for Doug with 99% accuracy what his answers will be. Guy says, LOL, guy in the back is a court reporter. Yeah, I read that one. BT says, I listened to it earlier, and it's even more painful the second time. Here for the podcast, nonetheless. Thank you, BT. I appreciate it. It's This is like my third time watching it. And I can say, I don't know if it's just talking to y'all and like maybe just like the little like roundtable conversation that we're having. I'm, I'm significantly more upset watching it the third time. Significantly. Like way more. Like this is... I would almost say a complete waste of time. And I don't blame Doug at all. Now, maybe. Okay. Let's take a deep breath. Let's be critical thinkers here. Let's try to think of reasons why these reporters would ask these stupid questions. Maybe they had to submit the questions to the Jaguars. And the Jaguars edited them and said, hey, ask this. And in that case, reporters, I don't blame you. Okay, if that's the case, if that's the one scenario that that happened, then I don't blame you. But if that wasn't the case, like I know seven YouTubers with zero subscribers who would ask better questions than this. And I'm not I am not kidding. Chef Boy says you can always blame your subordinates. Urban Meyer. <laughs> Steven Jaw says, so since Doug mentioned Mitch Morse, Arik Armstead, and Savage by name here, maybe that's his secret top three free agents from this offseason. Putting on my psychoanalysis hat. Yeah. Or maybe that was the only three he could think of. He maybe just forgot about Gabe Davis <laughs> and Ronald Darby. <laughs> and who was the D-end? How insignificant is that guy? I can't remember his name. And he'll probably end up being the best free agent addition. Whoever the, the Tyler Gibson or whatever. He's going to probably end up being the best guy. <laughs> Don't mention him at all. RM Skip says, can we all take a second to like the video? Oh, like the video. Yeah, hit the thumbs up button. You guys have been good about that. The views have been great. The comments have been great. The likes have been great. I appreciate it. You guys are awesome, dude. You guys really are. I mean, I love talking Jags with you guys. I mean, this is this is fun. I mean, I know I'm angry. But this is fun. I love talking Jags. I mean, if I had, if I didn't have a day job that was really demanding on my time because I'm a glutton for punishment and I choose low paying, high demand jobs because I'm, because I'm, I, that's the way I am. I would do this every day. <sighs> Let's get a media pass. Is that possible? I feel like it could be. Again, just my, my my freaking job, dude. I'm an athletic director. So, like, I manage, like, an entire school's sports. Like, everything. The scheduling. The compliance. The budget. The operations. The coaches. It's a lot of work, dude. And uh, I like it. I get to work in sports. I'm, I, I, I even get to help coach our tackle football team. And I can't be there as much as I want to be because I have to manage all the other sports that are happening. But I have a great head football coach. Um I, I, I watch film for him and I help him that way. Um, I help coach the defensive backs like when I can get there. Love my job. It's just, it's just it, part of the job is like it's a lot of hours. And like I'm sitting here talking like I'm the only person here that works a lot of hours. Okay. Please don't for a second think that I think that. I know that all you guys work a lot of hours too. And if you're in school, you're studying a lot of hours. I, I get that. I'm not trying to get any sympathy from you. I'm not. Please don't take it that way. I just wanted to convey my affection for doing this by saying I would do this every night if I had the time. That's all I was saying. That's all I was saying. Please, I'm not on a high horse. I'm not doing any of that stuff. Next question. Uh, ooh, how long – good question here. See, thank you. A good question. How long does it take – how long did it take you to shake off the Titans loss? Shake off the Titans loss. 
Well, for me, it's it's not so much that loss as much as it is the last you know six games um, when we were sitting there at eight and three and we had everything going for us and right in front of us. I I don't know if I'll ever get over it. I think for me, it's going to be my motivation, my fuel, you know, moving forward. Um, you know, and and I'm not going to let it cloud the vision, but at the same time, it, it's it's going to be it's going to be close in my mind um, as as I as I move forward with the team this spring. My favorite thing that he said, I don't know if I'll ever get over it. And again, he was referencing the entire collapse, not just the Titans game. But I feel like that's how that's how we would all feel. Is like, And I think that's why we can all relate to Doug Peterson so much. When we listened to Trent Baalke's press conference, he conveyed or gave us the sense that like the past doesn't matter to him. And that Man, that's just part of being in the NFL is that you have these epic – no, no. Doug Peterson's sitting here saying, I don't know if I'll ever get over that collapse. And it's going to fuel me for motivation for the rest of this offseason. Which, regardless if that's true or not, great to hear. Because that's how we all feel. And we don't get a paycheck from the Jaguars. And we feel that way. So it's nice to hear – an employee of the Jaguars, one, kind of feel the same way that we do. And I think that's why we all like Doug. It's because, yeah, he uses coach speak sometimes, but every once in a while he'll give you a little nugget, like here, that he is a real person. Rather than Trent Baalke, who's a freaking robot with no emotions and who can't draft. Okay, okay. all right, moving on to the questions. Uh, or the comments. BT says, oh, uh, yeah, I got that one. Jagger not, wh whose pro day will you be following? I've been kind of watching all the pro days. Um, I'm kind of gearing up for pre-draft stuff right now. I've been doing a little bit of research because I, you guys know me. I'm not going to give a, I'm not going to give a take or a opinion if I'm not, if I'm not educated. And, and if I'm not educated in players coming out of the draft, then I don't know why I would even do a show. So I have been doing some research. I'm pretty deep into the first round already. Um, Dar uh, uh, D Darnold Jones is the guy. I was trying to think of earlier the, the Oklahoma tackle who I thought we were going to draft. Uh, Dewan Jones. Dewan Jones? Yes. Uh, whatever his name was. Anyways, so I've been doing some research. Um, good, good draft. Good draft coming up. Some good players. Now, they do say that every year. They say that every year. That this is a deep draft for linemen. They've been saying that for years. And, even, and I heard someone say today, oh, this is the deepest draft I've ever seen for linemen. They say that every year. Deep draft for wide receivers. They say that every year. Uh, deep draft for edge rushers. They say that every year. <laughs> I don't know. Kev88 says, well, we pathetically lost to them twice in 99. Uh, actually, three times in 99. And 95% of our Titans games have been pathetic. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, next question is about Eric Armstead and what he will bring to the team and how he feels about him. Yeah, you know, this guy... First of all, he's played a ton of football. You know, Trent has familiarity with him, drafted him in San Francisco. Um, he's been an outstanding player for them, obviously, and, and somebody, the, a, a player that, you know, we got Josh Allen, who's, you know, a fifth-year guy. Trayvon's a young second-year guy, or going into his third. This is somebody that can come in and, and I think, can really, number one, help, help Trayvon, you know, continue to grow. But at the same time, give us what we need with the scheme that, that Ryan Nielsen wants to wants to employ um, by by having the pieces there. He can play defensive end. He can he can move inside on third down. He can you know same with Trayvon. He can play end. He can move inside. There's there's a lot of different things. And then you add Roy Robertson. You add Devon. You you know Josh in there. I mean there's there's a there's a the making of, of a potentially good defensive line by adding a guy like like Eric and his um, his credibility, his work ethic, um, and just the amount of football and where he's you know where he's played. I mean, I I don't know whoever said it because I can't keep track of all the comments that who said what, but with given how we could guess how he's going to answer. The the only thing that stood out to me, and again, maybe I'm I'm reaching here, and maybe I'm just over reading this, but he mentioned a lot about Trevon Walker, and the development of Trevon Walker, 
and the versatility of Eric Armstead and the age and the versatility of Trevon Walker and talked about Devon and talked about Roy and talked long and long and long and long and long. And then at the end mentioned uh, and Josh. And I think we could have the potential for a makeup of a good defensive line. Didn't hear a lot of Josh Allen in that answer. Now take that for what you, what you think he's on a, he's on a franchise tag. He's not here long term as of now. Wasn't a lot of Josh Allen in that answer about the D line. And again, maybe we're just reaching here. Maybe we're a little psychoanalyzing a little too deep, but uh, if Josh Allen's a guy we're about to pay a hundred million dollars to, um, he's mentioned him one time and it was barely into this question and called him Josh in passing. Uh, Sean R. Does anybody else dislike the new draft hats? The draft hats are never good. I think the NFL picks the draft hats. They have to because they're all the same for every team, like just with the different logos. But they're terrible, dude. And if you buy them... More power to you. You probably have more money than me. I love hats. I buy hats all the time. I was thinking about wearing this red corduroy hat that I only started wearing corduroy hat because Trevor Lawrence was wearing corduroy hats and it's a T dubs and it's a it's a place here in, in in Jack's Beach and they're a golf men's clothing store that I really like. Um, I was gonna wear this, but it was like the red on red. I was like, I'm not. I mean, I mean, come on. I mean, I don't overthink fashion, but like. I, I, I mean, and you know, there's probably people that probably think red on red looks really cool. And they're like, okay, I match. And like, that's fine. Um, you guys know me. I wear hats all the time. Um, I'm reaching Christ. The dreaming bird of life says I'm reaching. Uh, okay, and, and, and I, and I probably am. That's, and I probably am. And that's fair. Um, but if you buy the new draft hat, then you just have more money than me and you just like hats more than me. Rubicon Racer says the only time they didn't say it was a deep draft was the year they took Luke Jokel. That was a terrible draft to have a high draft pick. It seemed like, or maybe we just took an absolute egg in the top five. That was a bad draft. That was. It was like Greg Robinson that went overall to the Rams. Chef Florida Boy says, what do you think about Devin Duvernay? Nobody really talking about him. I think he's a better gadget than Agnew to me. Well, he's younger. He's actually a receiver. He's a, I think he's just as good as a kick returner as Agnew. And as much hate as we give Agnew, and I had a rant a couple shows ago about how the only thing that you have to do in the NFL is not fumble. Or if you're a quarterback, not throw interceptions. But to everyone else, just not fumble. That's the only thing you can't do on offense. And Agnew just has fumble issues. And for all the good he does, he, he fumbles. And there's no place on a team for people that fumble. I mean, look what happened with um, um, Tank Bigsby. Had fumble issues earlier in the season. Couldn't get on the field. Agnew fumbled at the worst possible time in the playoffs. And it killed us. And I think that was Darnell Savage. That. Was that Savage? No, it was. Uh, who was the corner that we were talking about trading for? Uh, for the Chiefs. It was him. Devin Alvarado says defense will be stacked if we draft a corner in the first round. Wide receiver in the second or third. D-line in the other. The rest of the draft, who cares? But trading out Darius Williams for any of these first round corners is nice. And adding Darby and Savage with Campbell and Cisco and Johnson back there. Okay, so Devin's a little bit bigger on the defense than I am. I love it. That's fine. And look, look good. Um, you're probably thinking what the team's thinking. And uh, that could be right. That could be. And hopefully it is. Um, I've, I've watched some of these. I mean, both the Alabama corners are, are really good. Um, I could see them both being gone. I know like they're not mocked to be gone, but I could see them being gone before they get to us. I could see a run of corners happening right before us. Um, but okay. I'm just worried about the safeties. And I know the safety position has been devalued, but like that's what that's, that's a load of crock. Every position is important. Like, Look at the most devalued position, running back. I would pay any amount of money for Christian McCaffrey. So there are players who transcend the devalue of the position. Same as safety. I mean, look at what Kyle Hamilton's done. He's a devalued safety. He's a huge part of the Ravens. So, I mean, yes, the position generally can be devalued. But if you have a player there who's a playmaker, it doesn't matter like what position he is if he's a playmaker. I mean, center has traditionally been devalued. And look at guys like Kelsey. Uh, they make the team so much better, even though they're a devalued position, right? So, 
It is what it is. All right, last one we're going to get to. Um, how much does leadership skills help? Multiple times a year. How much does that play into a uh, it's guy huge. like that? It's huge. You know, those, and again, that's the reason why you go get guys like that that have, that have kind of been there and done it. They, they're, they're, you know, the, the pinnacle of our sport. And, and, you know, I need guys on our team that have had accolades and awards like that that uh, um, our guys can see exactly what that looks like, right? And, and that's kind of the next step or the next phase for us as a team. Uh, moving forward. Do you think you guys got comfortable at eight and three? Okay, well, uh, I'm, 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 I'm a rookie. Over, I'm like these reporters. I can't even get the screen right on here. All right, last one we're going to look at. Uh, did you guys get comfortable at eight and three, and how did you personally handle that? Last one we're going to look at. Or maybe even going into the season. I, be I believe. I believe so. I, I believe you can can definitely get get comfortable. Um, you can kind of believe and, and, and read into the, the hype that's surrounding your football team. And, you know, that's the one thing that you can't have, right? Um, you got to guard against that, obviously. And, and um, you know, that's something that I think our team is going to realize, you know, um, moving forward. How do you personally handle that? You're good with messaging. Yeah, I mean, it's just, it's just a matter of staying positive. I think it's just staying forward focus forward thinking and and um you know I, I you hate to live in the past but i think you can remember the past you know and i think it's i think it's fuel moving forward it's kind of our motivation as we as we go how do you how do you handle it you stay positive you focus on the future so that's what we're going to do boys we're going to stay positive I'll, I'll take this one. This one's on me. I was a little negative here, okay? I was a little negative on this show, and I apologize, guys. Like, that's not me. You know, that's not my brand. It's not my style. I'm a little upset. You know, it, it manifested itself tonight. Um, I wanna, I'll blame the reporters, but again, that's not taking ownership. I'll take ownership of my emotions. I'm typically the positive person. I'm typically the person that looks forward. So going forward, that's what we're going to do. We're going to stay positive. We're going to focus on the future. Christ is the redeeming bread of life, says, I wish we could fast forward to the draft. That's what we're going to focus on now. We are no longer going to talk about last season. We're no longer going to talk about the collapse. We're done with that. It's a different team. we got a different team. This is, that's not who we are. We are no longer the 2023 Jags. We are the 2024 Jags. So we're moving forward. And we're going to talk about the draft. We're going to talk about the players coming up in the next couple of shows. So I apologize. I'm sorry. That's not me. That's not who I am. I got outside of myself tonight. Moving forward, I'm committed to being positive and forward-looking. Thank you guys for being here tonight. I really appreciate it. Had a nice long show tonight. I love that. Sorry about starting late. Out of my control there. But I appreciate all the commenters here tonight. Uh, make sure to like the video before, um, at some point, I guess at any point is fine. If you want to leave a comment afterwards, um, that always helps the algorithm. So, you know, if you want to tell a friend that's a Jags fan, um, or you can have a kid and raise them to be a Jags fan. I, I also encourage that because that's that's what we can do as well, like we've seen in the chat. So uh, nice job uh, to everyone in the comments. I had a great discussion with you guys tonight. Special shout out to the channel members here tonight. BT, RM Skip, 100 miles per hour, um, Volk Fang. Uh, we had, um, who else? It was Sea Breacher. Um, we had Cam Boysvert in here. We had... Um, we got RM Skip already going through. There's a lot of comments tonight, so you guys is taking me a while. Sorry about that, boys. Nolly Full Cab, Rico. I uh, appreciate all you guys. Thank you for being channel members. I really appreciate that. That supports the stream. Everyone else that was here, thank you so much, too. I love you guys. I can't wait to talk Jags going forward. Uh, I may try to do a show later this week. I got a little bit of free time at the end of the week, so maybe expect a Friday show. Maybe we'll just talk Jags, um, and, and, and we'll do that. I'm going to... Jump on Twitch here at least for an hour here. I'm going to take a little five-minute break, refill my drink, um, get my thoughts collected a little bit. I'm going to jump on Twitch. We can talk Jags a little more informally there um, and then maybe preoccupy our ADD minds with some video games. So that's what we're going to do. Thank you guys again. I appreciate it. I love you guys from the bottom of my heart. I will see you guys very, very soon. And until then, go Jags.